Eureka, Illinois, May 2000. Hornet shortstop Ben Zobrist is sitting despondently in his Ford pickup truck. After going unscouted, undrafted, and not being offered any scholarships, he believes he just played his final game in organized baseball as a high school senior. 16 years later, he had one of the most decisive hits in MLB history. How did this happen? Well, sheer determination, some analytics magic, and possible divine intervention. Ben Zobrist was born and raised in Eureka, Illinois, a town that registered a population of 5,193 people in 2021. Ben's father was a pastor, and Christianity was and continues to be a big part of Zobrist's life. I think for me, I tried to perform well as a ball player, and then I would try to perform as a Christian. Full disclosure, I can't cover his career without discussing his religious beliefs. I understand my audience comes from varying backgrounds, and I don't want to lean one way or the other. Even Zobrist himself has stated in the past he doesn't try to force religion on anybody. Either way, just be aware, Christianity is going to be brought up a few times throughout this story. Zobrist was an undersized shortstop slash pitcher throughout high school. One coach described him as being able to get the ball just past the infield if he really got a hold of one. What Zobrist lacked in pure physicality, he more than made up for with uncanny instincts on the field. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to entice scouts to drive to a school with a graduating class of like 50 people only to witness a 5'3", 115-pound high schooler who was valued for his good instincts. After his team lost in the IHSA Class A Regionals, Zobrist drove aimlessly throughout downtown Eureka. Even though he had accepted that a career in baseball was not for him, he couldn't help but feel an overwhelming somberness knowing the joy he had whenever stepping onto the diamond was largely past him. I think many of you all who played high school baseball could relate to this feeling. You know you were good. Maybe not good enough to play into college, but now the feeling you got from being on a team and playing with your friends in a highly competitive environment is now gone. Yeah, you can join some indie ball league, but now you gotta find a real job and move on with your life. Zobrist, however, didn't want to move on. At the very least, he wanted to see how far he could go before the wheels fell off completely. During the summer following his graduation, Zobris asked his high school coach, Bob Gold, about any open tryouts that he could show up to. Gold happened to have a flyer sitting on his desk for a tryout going on in Bushnell, about 90 minutes away from Eureka. Only caveat is that it would cost Ben $50. Elliot Johnson, not Zobris' future teammate Elliot Johnson, uh, this guy, was holding tryouts to fill the last remaining roster spots for his Olivet Nazarene Tigers. Even though he was not expecting to scout anybody of note at this tryout, Johnson was blown away by Zobrist's intensity. Zobrist, who wasn't expecting much from the tryouts either, was thrown off when Johnson approached him about a potential scholarship for him to attend Olivet Nazarene University so he could pitch and play shortstop for their baseball team. Zobrist was reluctant at first. He had intended to attend Calvary Bible College to become a pastor just like his father. But after some soul searching, Zobrist felt that it was God's plan for him to become a baseball player. While many baseball programs, even smaller ones, would automatically dismiss a freshman who is hovering under 5'5 and weighs a buck 20 soaking wet, Olivet saw the willingness Zobris possessed as a team player. They understood his ability to play every position, including as a pitcher, good base running instincts, ability to work counts, lay off bad pitches, and smoke the mistakes left by lesser competition. Nazarene was rewarded with their first conference championship, with Ben Zobrist playing a key role both on the mound and at the plate. The school, knowing that he needed to take his talents to a Division I university to continue his career, let him transfer out to Dallas Baptist. This is the start of the symbiotic relationship Ben will have with teams that understand his value, and are subsequently validated with success beyond their measures. I know what you're all thinking. This is the ad read. Why am I not skipping this right now? Do you know why you haven't skipped it? Because I'm wearing these glasses, and these glasses are awesome. But the reason you're still here is because you want to learn something today. I could just sit here and, and, and sing the praises of Rival Fantasy all day, like, oh, they're the best 
fantasy platform. It's trying to reinvigorate the social game when it comes to fantasy sports instead of just trying to take all your money. But that's not going to entice you. I saw the metrics. You weren't enticed enough. So let, let me teach you something. So first thing you got to do to create a challenge, just click on challenges. That was so freaking easy. So the first thing you will see when you click on the challenges page are the daily fantasy challenges provided by Rival Fantasy. Super easy, they pit two similar players against each other and just ask you who will score more fantasy points. But you know what? My audience aren't sheep, we're leaders. Look at these glasses, do, do, do these look like the glasses that a sheep would wear? No, because sheep can't wear glasses. It's physically impossible, I've tried. So what we're gonna do is go to the top right here, social challenges, right there, top right corner for you, just click on it. And will you look at that? I have no new challenges. Let's. Let's change that. Be the change that you want to see in the world, right? So go to the bottom here, this nice, beautiful emerald green button, click on it. So you see these two blank squares here, we got to fill them in. Typically my strategy for these daily fantasy challenges is to find a player with a lot less name recognition, but who is on an absolute tear right now. And that's got to be Oswaldo Cabrera. He has been, in the words of Jesse Lee Peterson, amazing. So you see, I found him right here. He's the only player in baseball right now with the name Oswaldo. So when I pick a player who has less name recognition, I want to put him against somebody who is a household name, but who I think is super overrated. So let's stay on the left side of the field. Who do I think is the most overrated third baseman in all of baseball? That's easy. It's Alex Bregman. No, no question about it. So there we go. Oswaldo Cabrera versus Alex Bregman. They're playing each other today, and I think Oswaldo Cabrera is going to score more points. So I press continue, select Oswaldo Cabrera. Now, this is the point some people get iffy on a platform like this when it comes to the money. Think about a Saturday night with your friends playing Texas Hold'em. You're not trying to bankrupt anybody. You're not trying to be a high roller, but putting money on it does make it more interesting. And it doesn't have to be a lot, just a dollar. That's less than an Arizona iced tea right now. So I'm just going to put a dollar on Oswaldo Cabrera, create the challenge, and I'm sending it to my friends. And even better, you can share it anywhere. You can share on Facebook if you still use Facebook can share it on X, formerly known as Twitter. I can email it. I can copy the link anywhere. So if you have a group chat uh, where you've been just praising Oswaldo Cabrera incessantly, send this link here. You know, if, you're, if your friends are really trying to convince you that Alex Bregman is better than Oswaldo Cabrera, well, here we go. That's how you create a challenge in Rival Fantasy. Even better, if you sign up right now using the code NOMOREFIELDERS, it's on the screen right now, you get $25 in vouchers. That's house money right there. That's that's $25 you can use just to, just to try it out. And I've been emphasizing this. I want to use this platform to connect with everybody here. So for the next 96 hours, if you add me on Rival Fantasy, I will add you back. And for the next 72 hours, if you send me a challenge, I will accept it. You think I'm bluffing, but I'm not. Look at these glasses. Thank you again to Rival Fantasy for sponsoring this video, making my dreams come true of wanting to be a baseball YouTuber slash touring musician. Let's learn about Ben Zobrist. The Houston Astros scouting department took note of the now six foot three Zobrist while he was with nearby Dallas Baptist and drafted him as a shortstop in the sixth round of the 2004 draft. Zobrist, being a bit older than his peers, showed some pop in his first few seasons in the Astros minor league system. Then came the trade. Following the 2005 season, the Devil Rays ownership, after fielding teams that couldn't even earn participation ribbons for so long, decided to make sweeping organizational changes in order to develop something of a competitive team and hopefully clinch their first playoff berth in franchise history before the end of the decade. Newly minted owner Stu Sternberg hired manager Joe Madden and promoted their director of baseball development, Andrew Friedman, to hold the reins as president of baseball operations. Okay, is this where we talk about Moneyball? Look, I don't want to bore anyone here. So let's turn this into a crash course, okay? Something that most people don't understand is that Moneyball works many different ways. It has to. Building a team of 26 players on the active roster and 14 other players in reserve is not a straightforward task. There are different pillars to it. One of the core and most well-known pillars of Moneyball is in finding market inefficiencies by valuing player metrics that other teams aren't valuing as much. The idea is that a team with a minuscule payroll like the Devil Rays can find a diamond in the rough and be able to acquire them for pennies on the dollar. You know the old saying, never trade with the Rays? Well, their acquisition of Ben Zobrist could be considered the genesis of that sentiment.
The Houston Astros were coming off a World Series appearance the year before, when their entire roster experienced a massive regression. They wanted to kickstart their offense in the second half. Enter Devil Rays third baseman Aubrey Huff. Huff was something of a franchise icon in St. Petersburg, setting and pacing several key franchise hitting records. But the Devil Rays were going nowhere fast with him and wanted to clear his expiring contract. The Astros believed Huff was the key to reviving their dead offense and pulled the trigger to acquire him from the Devil Rays for Ben Zobrist and Mitch Talbot making this one of Andrew Friedman's first major acquisitions. While the Astros saw a career minor leaguer, the Rays saw someone who could change the course of their entire franchise. Okay, maybe not that far, but this gets to another pillar of Moneyball, a player's floor. A floor is essentially what a player is at their absolute worst, barring any major injury. It evaluates their inputs such as defensive instincts, contact rate, and plate discipline, skills that are inherent to a player and immune to any changes to their physique or even to the run environment itself. Most teams look at the 25-year-old Zobrist and see a player with a low ceiling. Basically, they were blinded by the limits of his production. He wasn't fast, didn't generate much power, maybe a depth piece at best. But the Devil Rays saw his immense floor outweighing his ceiling. They looked at him and saw the player that could play multiple positions well, steal a few runs on the base paths, make consistent contact, but most importantly, had elite plate discipline. Andrew Friedman would eventually bring this philosophy of external player evaluation over to Los Angeles, and it's how Dodgers fans would get treated with players such as Justin Turner, Chris Taylor, and Max Muncy. Ben Zobrist would make his Major League debut less than a month later against the Detroit Tigers. His early results were laughable, just like the Devil Rays who would finish 2006 with their ninth straight season of 90 plus losses since their inception. The next season was even worse for Zobrist, who at the age of 26 was looking like the wheels had finally come off. Even if his story ended here, I bet Zobrist would still feel very satisfied with what he was able to accomplish. He went from believing his playing career was over after his high school graduation to playing for a Division I school and climbing his way through professional ball all the way to the majors. While those skills vaunted by the Devil Rays front office were poking through, his lack of power went from a minor quirk to a full-on defect as he approached his physical peak. Contrary to what many DIY fitness accounts will tell you, in athletics, you pretty much are what you are by the time you reach your mid-20s. Don't believe me? Well, here is every player from the 2000s who slugged under 350 in their first 100 games after turning 25. The y-axis is what they ended up slugging throughout their whole career. As you can see, pretty much none of these players were able to develop power into their late 20s. Being on this chart is by no means a career death sentence though. Rajay Davis would become one of the biggest stolen base threats of the 2010s, and Corky Miller would become a Reds legend with the best stash in the game. But you are who you are by the time you turn 25, barring any miracle. Ben Zobrist qualifies among these players, but which dot is his? Is it this one, this one right here? Well, it's actually none of these. So what happened? How was Zobrist able to defy what not only the data, but the nature of player development itself said was impossible to become a formidable power threat? Well, many of us would call it a chance encounter, but to Zobrist, it was divine intervention. Jamie Savalas was a mediocre hitter throughout his life. He was able to play his way onto Mount St. Mary University's team due to his decent glove, but his bat was a liability. According to him, he never hit a home run throughout high school and hit 197 during his freshman year of college. One fateful day, he made a slight adjustment to his swing and overnight went from one of the worst hitters on the team to, in his words, the best. From there, he became a student of the swing and has developed countless measurements and techniques in order to instantly improve hitters' mechanics. I might be out of pocket in saying this, 
but his approach to analyzing swings was very similar to what you'd see in an institution such as Driveline. Even today, he continues to coach hitters and even has his own YouTube channel where he analyzes MLB players' swings and posts instructional videos. It's really fascinating, and I recommend giving him a watch even if you aren't currently playing. I have linked his channel below. During the 2007 offseason, just two weeks after he decided to start teaching his philosophies, Zavallis happened to be soliciting his coaching services at Showtime Sports in Franklin, Tennessee, where Ben Zobrist happened to be taking batting practice. Jamie approached Ben and told him he saw some immediate mechanical changes he could make to instantly generate more power. At first, Ben was apprehensive about totally remaking his swing. While recollecting the story to D-Ray's Bay, Savalas said Ben told him that he was a situational hitter and didn't want to lose the consistency that got him to the big leagues. But Savalas assured Ben that he could still maintain that consistency while adding some power. Savalas' biggest mantra is the front arm dominating approach. His belief is that hitters can maximize their power by dropping their shoulders and straightening their front arm during their swing. He and Ben worked over the offseason to modify a swing to incorporate that approach. If you want more information on the exact mechanics Savalas changed, he does have a video on his channel giving explanation. The result was a rebranded approach for Zobrist. He still maintained his elite plate discipline that got him through AAA, but now he could combine that with actual in-game power. Speaking of rebrand, his Devil Race decided to drop the Devil going into the 2008 season, opting to go forward as just the Rays. A change I imagine Ben appreciated. Many insiders took note of their rapidly evolving approach to team building and saw something special brewing in their young starting rotation, which was headlined by James Shields, Matt Garza, and Scott Casimir, all of whom were under the age of 27. Unfortunately, Ben Zobrist suffered a broken thumb in spring training and had to start the year on the IL. He would be activated on May 15th, becoming something of a bus rider as the utility man was sent down on May 29th before being called up and sent down again despite having two monster games against their cross-state rabble Marlins. When he was called back up on July 5th, Zobrist knew he had to become indispensable to avoid the fate that has hung over him his entire playing career. As a result, his home run rate went from a career 1% to 5.1% in 2008. For reference, fellow switch hitting infielder Ozzy Albies had a 5% homer rate in 2023, a year in which he hit 33 homers. Zobrist was the final piece for the upstart Rays, who not only posted their first campaign with less than 90 losses, not only their first winning season, not only their first playoff appearance, but took their high-powered roster all the way to the division title in a cutthroat AL East. Their revamped approach to team building guided by the Moneyball philosophy, led to one of the greatest multi-year turnarounds in the 21st century, thanks in no small part to the aforementioned rotation, rookie wonderkind Evan Longoria, the on-base and speed threats of Carl Crawford and BJ Upton, and Ben Zobrist, who became a pleasant surprise for a race team who was expecting a player who would give replacement level production at multiple positions, but instead saw someone who had the ability to outproduce the players he was backing up for. The Rays were able to overcome their division rival in a seven game thriller to advance to the World Series against the Phillies. Zobrist was given the start in two games and was not able to produce much. His final chance came in game five with a runner on second and one out. Ben lined out in a one and two count. Also, I noticed that the Chiron states that it's two and one, but I just want to clarify that it was a one and two count and the crew at Fox got it wrong. Immediately. There he goes. Got a good jump throw down. I know this was over 15 years ago, but come on, guys. You gotta do better than that. You're ruining my foreshadowing over here. Normally, most teams are devastated after losing in the World Series, but the Rays had to be pretty content going from having one of the worst starts a franchise could imagine to a World Series appearance virtually overnight, while proving that their Moneyball approach to roster construction had some credence to it. Just like the Rays, Zobrist was amazed by his sudden success. 
he spent the offseason continuing to hone his newfound swing, one that led to his adorning of the nickname Zorilla, which is just an all-time nickname. I mean, you did it. Come on, with the best. just yeah. round of applause Woo, for the race. race. Now that he had the confidence of not only knowing that Jamie's teachings worked in-game, but that he was also guaranteed a roster spot at a minimum in 2009, this allowed him to go full throttle in refining his adjustments and preparing for what could be his first full season in the bigs. The undersized teenager that needed not one, but two miracles to fulfill, in his words, God's plan to continue playing ball after high school found himself a critical piece for a competitive major league team. In 2009, not only was he one of the best players on the Rays, he was arguably the best player in baseball. Here is every super utility season since integration. There are two points I want to make with this. Even though Ben Zobris posted the highest F4 this season, his value as someone who could play every position could not be more understated. First off, here are the OPSs for all these seasons. Typically, a player who has the ability to play positions 3 through 9 on the field are rostered solely for that one ability. Anybody who has played at any level understands the unique difficulty that comes with fielding each position. Most players who are able to master more than 5 do so because they couldn't cut it with the bat and needed to find another lane to stay valuable. I mean, Ben Zobrist himself fell under that category. Even with their offensive deficiencies, they're still valuable to a roster because of their ability to play every position besides pitcher and catcher. Their role is to provide roster flexibility and to give acceptable production while filling in for other players. But what if they gave exceptional production? This dot right up here, towering over all, is Ben Zobris's 2009. Some people have Barry Bonds' 2004, Griffey Jr.'s 96, Trout's rookie year, but this, this right here, might be my favorite season of all time. To be up front, he spent most of his games at second and right field, and only played one game at third, presumably because Evan Longoria was off saving on-field reporters that day. But this gets to another fun attribute of Zobris's season. Here's every Super. utility player from 2009 through 2013. Obviously we know Zobrist blew them out of the water offensively, but here's the amount of mid-game position changes each made. Now if you thought playing every position was difficult, just imagine changing positions in the middle of a game. You have to rethink your first move when the ball is hit on the fly with no pre-game preparation. Most players, even Super. utility players, have a hard time with this, not Ben Zobrist. The same player who would do anything to stay on the field had no issue changing positions whether it was the second or the 13th inning. He was also adept at every one of them. Even though I'm personally skeptical of fielding data, especially before StatCast, Zobrist graded out as roughly average or better at four of the seven positions he logged time at in 2009. This allowed Rays manager Joe Madden 
one of the game's most innovative and outside-the-box thinkers to deploy Zobrist as a defensive weapon to his strategic liking. This is where Ben Zobrist's value as someone who could play acceptable defense for every position reveals itself in unexpected ways. Take this game on September 27th in Texas, for example. The Rays are down 3-6 going into the top of the ninth. Joe Madden needs to jumpstart this offense, so he sends up Akinori Iwamura to pinch hit for first baseman Chris Richard. Iwamura draws a walk, which catalyzes a four-run inning to help the Rays steal the lead and force the bottom of the ninth. Awesome. Only problem, Iwamura is a few inches short of being an acceptable first baseman, and you don't really want to put the game in the hands of a September call-up with regular first baseman Carlos Pena out for the season. No problem. All Madden has to do is slide Zobrist from second base to first and allow Iwamura to fill in at second without compromising the infield defense. And when you look at that, it actually worked like a charm. By the way, the player who got the key hit to tie this game up, Ben Zobrist. This relationship between Joe Madden, arguably one of the game's most inventive managers, and Ben Zobrist, arguably one of the most fun players to roster, due to his Swiss Army Knife ability to play every position, was baseball's version of Belichick and Brady, or Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan. A marriage of outside-the-box thinking, and someone willing to do whatever it takes to help his team win. Whether it was playing in shallow right field as a second baseman, or swapping positions on a moment's notice. Zobrist and Madden was an unexpectedly ideal pairing of people who found completely different approaches to the same outcome. While the Rays' offense was a fully functional unit in 2009, their pitching staff regressed to levels beyond our comprehension. Their AL East crown was usurped by the Yankees, who were in the dying days of their version of Moneyball, aka just signing all the best players that offseason and dealing with the consequences later on. This performance was enough for the Rays to offer a five-year extension to Zarilla at the beginning of the 2010 season. Andrew Friedman made it a point to showcase Zobrist as the model player for their burgeoning franchise. While Zobrist would regress in the power department in 2010, his immense fielding ability and inherent skills we discussed earlier made sure he was still a valuable contributor that season. He would continue to post excellent numbers for the Rays as they experienced their best stretch in franchise history. Zobrist himself became something of a celebrity, especially in the Christian world, even getting a cameo alongside fellow Christian athletes John Cruck and Rick Sutcliffe in 2013's Ring the Bell. And man, if this whole baseball thing did in fact end after high school, I honestly think he would have had a shot in acting. This is a serious tearjerker of a performance right here. I have Jesus in my heart, and I never got to ring the bell. Well, get up there. Come on. Okay. Yeah. 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 Woo. Rob, thanks for bringing us out here. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, I, I really think you found something here. Chills. Unfortunately, 2008 was the peak of the Friedman Madden Zoberst era. The Rays couldn't advance past the division series from then on, getting snuffed out by the Rangers who were doing a slightly better Moneyball impression in 2010 and 2011, and by the 2013 Red Sox who won that year's World Series using nothing but generational aura and the power of bad grooming practices. This era came to a head when in October of 2014, following their worst season since 2007, Andrew Friedman left the Rays front office to join the Dodgers. This departure activated an opt-out clause in Joe Madden's contract. Sound familiar? To which Madden used without much second thought. Zobrist wasn't very far behind. In a sardonic twist mirroring his predecessor, one of the first moves new president of baseball ops Matt Silverman made was to trade Ben Zobrist to the Athletics. After sending off Josh Donaldson and Jeff Samarja, Many thought the A's were waving the white flag after a quick exit in one of the most thrilling wildcard games against the Royals. But Billy Bean, the original practitioner of Moneyball, was simply doing a retooling of their roster. Even after coming off of left knee surgery in April, Zobrist was his usual valuable self upon his return. However, the A's retooling left a lot to be desired. Their offense sputtered, and they gave the second most amount of starts to starter Jesse Chavez. That's right starter Jesse Chavez, who struggled in the largest workload he would experience in his professional career. At the trade deadline, the A's shipped Zobrist off to the same team that eliminated them the year prior. 
the Kansas City Royals, who were experiencing their best stretch of baseball since the 1980s. Zobris filled in nicely for the injured Alex Gordon, before taking over for the defective Omar Infante at second upon Gordon's return. Zobris's versatility proved invaluable to the Royals roster, which relied on everything Zobris was good at for their success. You could say it was a match made in heaven. Even though Zobris was still recovering from knee surgery when the A's visited the TROP, he got the opportunity to return to Tampa Bay for a series against the Rays in late August. Just like Olivet Nazarene when they let him transfer to Dallas Baptist, the Rays faithful understood that no matter what uniform Zobrist happened to wear, they were always going to cheer for him. Well, it's, it's different, you know, it's a, it's a little awkward, to be honest. There's a little bit of an internal struggle going on in, in my heart right now, but, um, you know, it's been great overall just getting to come back here and, and see people and, and very little has changed, you know, since last year. So, yeah, it's just been, been fun memories for me just walking in and I almost went into the wrong clubhouse, I think, just by nature, just... Uh, Excited to see everybody, though. Number 18, Ben Zobrist. In a year dominated by small market teams, the Royals stood atop as the powerhouse of the AL. They recovered from a devastating loss in the World Series the year before as a stronger and more resilient group. Zobrist had a monster ALCS, rewriting some of the playoff woes from his time with the Rays. This helped the Royals advance to the World Series, where they were set to face the 2015 Mets. Second time covering the 2015 World Series this year? Hell yeah! Because this series had to be different from the other girls, Game 1 goes into extra innings after Alex Gordon hit a game-tying home run in the ninth. The Mets bring in the man of a million pounds himself, Bartolo Colon, to try and keep the game in the balance while the Royals bring in future Rangers GM Chris Young to do the same. In the 14th inning, after Alcides Escobar reaches on an error, Ben Zobris comes up to the plate, attempting to keep this rally going, something the Royals failed to do in consecutive innings prior to this one. That's a base hit in the right. Escobar will hit the third. The Royals would go on to win the World Series in five games. Despite not driving in a single run, Ben would score five key runs while posting the highest CWPA, a mark of a true team player. Unfortunately, he did not receive World Series MVP because he was teammates with Salvador Perez, the same man who has appeared in eight All-Star games despite having a career OBP of 300. Ben Zobrist was a free agent for the first time in his career. The same man who was a misplaced flyer away from calling it quits after graduation could now test the free market which was very much interested in his services. Teams such as the Mets, Braves, Cardinals, and Giants were attempting to court him, but none of them could match the team that was most interested. Enter Theo Epstein. Epstein is something of a moneyball savant. He took over as the Red Sox GM in 2002, made the unpopular move of trading Nomar Garcia Parra, and perhaps made the biggest diamond in the rough acquisition when he signed a designated hitter who had trouble finding his footing in Minnesota, but had a swing that would make Jamie Savalas blush. He was known as the Curse Buster after the Red Sox won their first World Series in 86 years, and 12 years later is on the precipice of doing the same for the longest championship drought in sports history. He has assembled a strong, talented, and versatile roster, but he needed a final piece to make this team a virtual lock in the postseason. The convergence of Epstein, if Moneyball was an executive, and Zobrist, if Moneyball was a player, was one of the best pairings you could ask for. But it wasn't the best.
the Cubs were to pay Zobrist $56 million over four years. Normally, giving a 34-year-old coming off a career-worst season a four-year contract goes against another Moneyball pillar of not tying yourself up with multi-year contracts for older players. But if you were to make one exception, this is it. Reuniting with his manager and on the strongest, deepest roster he's ever been on, Zobrist shined as a second baseman who could slot anywhere if he needed to, even manning shortstop for the first time in two years. The stacked Cubs finished with their best record since 1935, steamrolled through the NLDS, and took out a strong Dodgers team in the NLCS to get to their first World Series since World War II. In the 111th World Series, the Cubs offense was stifled by the brilliance of Corey Kluber, Josh Tomlin, yes, Josh Tomlin, and Andrew Miller. Ben Zobrist, who hit a key RBI triple in Game 2, stalled alongside his teammates in Games 3 and 4. The Cubs had their backs against the wall going into Game 5. But just like Ben Zobrist after he graduated high school, all they could do is play with everything they got until the wheels fell off completely. Game 7 of the 2016 World Series might be the best game ever based solely on the premise. Here you have two teams with the first and second longest championship droughts in MLB history going into a do or die game. Either way, one forlorn fan base is leaving vindicated. It still had no business delivering on every promise it made going in. We could talk about Joe Madden's pitching strategy, Rajay Davis's second mention in this video, the rain delay. Jason Hayward's speech during the rain delay, but this story is focused on one person and one person only. What many forget is that Ben Zobrist was having a tough game leading up to this at bat in the 10th. He flew out with a runner on second in the first, grounded out for a fielder's choice with two runners on in the top of the fourth, which to Zobrist's credit, used his base running instincts to advance to second on a throw home and ended up scoring but lined out to end the fifth with a runner on second and an opportunity to put the game out of reach. Of course, the Cleveland Sharps were able to claw their way back and throttle us into extra innings. They intentionally walk Rizzo to get to the struggling Zobrist. This is the setup every kid dreams of in their backyard. World Series Game 7, extra innings, runner on second with a chance to take the lead. A scenario which was the last thing on Zobrist's mind when he spent that night aimlessly driving around downtown Eureka all those years ago. But here he is living it. This graphic is really messed up when you consider the fact that three of these at-bats are from Zobrist, who, as I just stated, put up goose eggs in each one of them. After reliever Brian Shaw gives Zobrist a very hittable cutter followed by his most unhittable cutter of the night, Zobrist is in a position that he is all too familiar with going back to 2008, when, as you remember, he lined out with a runner on second on a 1-2 and two count and one out in the last inning of the season. Ben came a long way to get there, and has come an even longer way to get here. He's able to fight off another cutter and realizes if he's able to put a similar swing on that pitch and time it just right, all he needs to do is slap the ball down the third baseline to get it past Jose Ramirez, who's playing well away from it. Ben does just that.
Zobrist would retire in 2019 after having a disagreement with his pastor or something. I don't know. I didn't do that much research for this. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. If you made it this far, comment one of your favorite songs of all time. I am desperate for some recommendations. Also, like the video too. That's important. Bye.